Hello and welcome to the Amber Spycast, your weekly one-stop shop for everything His Dark Materials. Your His Dark Materialists are myself, Alaric, Joanna, and Travis, who are all here today to talk about chapters 8 and 9 of The Golden Compass, which were so great, and I can't wait to hear Joanna's recap. Hit it. All right. So Alaric and Travis and his dark materialists, chapters eight and nine. Lyra is acclimating to the knowledge that Lord Azrael and Mrs. Coulter are her mother and father. And while she finds it is easier to accept Lord Azrael as a paternal figure, acknowledging Mrs. Coulter as her mother is another story. Lyra quickly falls back into her wily and adventurous ways, exploring the fens and telling outrageous stories to the Egyptian children. While the police continue to search for Lyra, she bides her time, relentlessly questioning Ma Costa about the story of her birth and studying the alethiometer. Three days later, John Fa holds a second roping, collecting money and assessing the forces for each of the six head Egyptian families. The man from the last roping speaks up again, this time questioning why they are harboring Lyra when there is a hefty bounty for her return. John Fa reminds him that Lyra is Lord Azrael's daughter, who assisted and advocated for the Egyptians multiple times and that they will protect her at all cost. Lyra tells Tony that she wants to help with the expedition north, but her hopes are dimmed when he tells her that she's already done her part. When the roping is over, the men retire to the parlay room to discuss their plans. True to form, Lyra boldly walks in to plead her case to John Fa, but he emphatically tells her no. She tries to ingratiate herself with several members of the expedition party and ends up focusing her efforts on Farder Coram, who talks and listens to the girl instead of sending her away. She and Farder Coram grow close, studying the lithiometer and figuring out how it works. During one such lesson, a gravely injured Egyptian spy returns from a reconnaissance mission. He tells Farder Coram that Benjamin de Ruder, the same man that Lyra was investigating with the lithiometer, is dead and that the children have been taken to the Arctic region known as Lapland. Farder Coram calls for John Fa, who decides that Lyra must accompany them to the north. Lyra spends the next two weeks preparing to leave and studying the alethiometer. Feeling cramped below deck, Lyra asks Farder Coram if she can go out, to which he agrees. Within minutes of being topside, Pantalaemon is attacked by a clockwork beetle sent by Mrs. Coulter. After being saved by a Tillerman's demon, Lyra stows her things in her cabin below deck and begins her journey north. A hefty journey ahead, an exciting journey ahead. Absolutely. This this was not a long, um, there wasn't a lot that happened, and yet it felt so full. Does that make sense? Like, it wasn't like they did a whole bunch of different things, um, like going from place to place, but so much was going on in just this little bit of time. It was really cool to read. It was like the just the preparation for departure was – there's so much going on, and it was, there was a, such a great um, – uh, the way that – that uh, she's integrating into their their society, and uh, you can sort of the smells and the tastes and the and the the visuals of, of the being on the boats and preparing it, uh, the you know the final roping. It's it is it's really evocative. I'm going to um, defer differ from you guys a little bit, and I uh, think that this might be the first chapter chapter eight in any case that uh, I wasn't overly enthused by. It felt uh, bet- the combination between uh, – actually, no, Chapter 8 kind of felt like uh, just an, uh, an, the first half of it just felt like a tag on to Chapter 7. I mean, Chapter 7, we got the the big conversation, you know, learning that the first roping. And then the second one, I don't know, it just felt like uh, – I guess the first half could have been – and without much discussion, they said yes – uh, and then kind of, uh, I don't know, show us a lot more of what we saw rather than, um, you know, give us the exposition bombs. Sure. Though yeah. um, I did enjoy uh, learning uh, what Lord Azrael's background was with the with the Egyptians and why they had a bit of loyalty to him. Though uh, so I still, if I if I were the guy who was, uh, you know, speaking out against. Uh, the rescue mission. I kind of think I might have been uh, not have been persuaded 
by um, John Fah's explanation for why I'm sending 170 guys and uh, spending a bunch of gold coin for uh, for Lord Azrael. Hmm. I, I feel like one of the things I really liked about this, even chapter eight, was we got to see how the Egyptians work as a community. And so, you know, we get to see how Jordan College works and we get to see how Mrs. Coulter's life works. And so now here's the, the time and the chance to kind of slow down. You know, they're, they're kind of this roping that that takes some time, you know, they they have to get there and then they spend multiple days even between the ropings. And we get a chance just to see the Egyptians and like, who are they? And and I, I really enjoy that kind of slow um, exposition-y uh, thing that's going on there. Um, so, yeah, I guess we will have to agree to disagree there. I, I appreciate even how Chapter 8 begins with Lyra uh, ingratiating herself with the, you know, the, the kids, uh, the Egyptian children, and embellishing her own story of the poisoning into almost a, a completely different version of the story. Her, her lying skills and her embellishment skills continue to uh, uh, evolve uh, early on in that chapter. And then we really start to get a taste of the alethiometer as well and um, how it works and and her relationship with Farder Quorum um, uh, becomes more complex. I think that there's some meat there. The, uh, it's funny. You brought up the um, her story. And I have to say that when um, she started to talk about the sword fight between Mr. Coulter and um, <laughs> yes. Lord Azrael, yeah. I actually thought – there was a sword fight. Like when I heard the original story, instantly thought sword fight. These two guys are like going at it with swords. This was a big brawl. No, Lord Osriel just came out and pow. He just shot just Indiana him. Jones. Him. Yeah. He, he picked up. <laughs> a, he picked up the gun or took the gun away from him and shot him in the head. And then he did. He's kind of weird. He holds the baby over the corpse and kind of like rocks the baby and then gets Ma Costa to clean up the mess. Yeah, it's cold, man. That's lame. <laughs> <laughs> so sit there and rock the baby. Look, look at your, uh, look at this guy's corpse. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. And, you know, she, even at, sort of at the end of all this, she's, she was like, um, uh, starts to believe that she actually did remember this fight. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh yeah. I was there. I remember that. I mean, I'm convinced that I, I remember my cousin's fourth birthday party and she's four years older than me. So <laughs> and I, rem- I distinctly remember being there. So, yeah, I understand where Lyra is coming from. That's funny. <laughs> I wonder if uh, Pan has any re- recollection of it. Like, oh, does, yeah. I wonder if he remembers that far back. Well, that's that's an interesting question about, like, what the demon is at, at birth and and when a child is sort of unformed, mm-hmm. what, what the demon does. Do they mature faster like an animal does? Are they more capable sooner? Um, can they change form? I mean, I, you know, babies are certainly aware of what's going on, but um, yeah, I wonder, we don't really get much about that. Do they even exist? Yeah. When do they blink into existence? Yeah. I could sort of picture an infant with a, you know, a, um, a marmot curled up next to it as it mm-hmm. grows, you know, and, and comforting it when it's sad. Mm-hmm. Um and entertaining it when it's lonely. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't know that we've seen that. We haven't seen that image. No, not yet. Or, uh, or even like a, a holiday, almost like a birthday where your demoning shows up, you know, this is, right. uh, uh, six months after you're born, then you get your demon. <laughs> right. All right. I, I keep imagining like a Muppet baby. For the, de- <laughs> for the demon. <laughs> wow. Sorry. <laughs> I feel a little giddy tonight. Yeah, just, just in a diaper and sorry, nanny. Anyway, <laughs> there's a little nursery where all the demons live. <laughs> oh goodness! Um, I think that's really interesting too because we get to see at least how demons differ when you're old. Like, I don't want to jump around too much, but just because this is making me think of it, there's a really cool part where they describe Farder Quorum. And then they describe his demon and, you know, he is walking with two sticks and he's wobbly. And while he's physically not there, um, you know, Lyra, it says there that his mind is sharp, 
but the demon is still very, you know, the way she describes his demon, I have to look up the name. It starts with an S. Sorry. Sophonex. Yeah. Sophonex. The way she describes it is beautiful. It's probably going to be one of my favorite passages at the end of the time. But, um, you know, the demon doesn't look like it has any, any of that going for it. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it is still as sharp and as beautiful and as uh, crisp, but Farter Quorum is not. Yeah. Lyra really wants to touch that demon and pet her fur. Yes. Uh, really drawn to that. And this is, um, if we're going to talk about demon life, um, this is another step in that sort of the, the continuing uh, learning more about how that, that works is um, I think we had assumed that you don't really touch like a human doesn't touch another person's demon. Demons touch each other, humans touch each other, but they don't, you don't really cross the streams. Um, this is that paragraph in describing Sofinax and, and how beautiful her fur is and how much Lyra wants, really wants to touch and feel what that fur feels like. She, um, she says, I think she says here, um, she's even speculated on what it might feel like. She never made the slightest move to touch her and never would. So she knows that's like a big time no, no. Right. And, and she says she couldn't even remember having it been told to her. She just knew instinctively yes. as though that nausea was bad and comfort was good. Um, it was utterly forbidden. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I'd want to pet it too. I agree. So soldiers don't even do that in a fight, right? Like they don't even uh, touch each other's demons. They, uh, that's right. Like it's, that's, yes. that's right. That's like it's, 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 it's worse than, you know, kicking them below the belt. I mean, this is just like a straight up. No, no, you don't do that in a fight. I mean, imagine and, the complexity of having a battle where there's just chaos and you're only fighting humans and your demons are only fighting other demons. Mm-hmm. Could you, could a demon fight – if you were fighting another human – we're never going to find this out. This is just me asking this question rhetorically maybe. But if you're fighting another human in a battle and your demon is fighting alongside you, could your demon – does your demon have to fight the person's demon that you're fighting? I don't know. Like I, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about like, – just I don't know why this popped into my head, but I'm just thinking of the Civil War. You know, the whole brother versus brother thing. Like, I just imagine, like, two demons, like, not fighting while their bodies are still – well, the, their their humans are still fighting, you know? Like, uh, there's just multiple levels to that entire conf- conflict then. Yeah. Right. Like, like, would there be some sort of connection between, like, my demon and my sister's demon? Mm-hmm. Like, didn't, you know what I mean? Like, because we are connected that way, would they be connected that way? Mm-hmm. Or what but if you were does- twins? Right. What if you're twins? Huh? Would you have the same demon? Yeah. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking more back to, to <laughs> kind of what this means, right? Like the, the no touching in combat. And it just makes me think, you know, how brutal war can be. You know, just just think about you know something like Saving Private Ryan or something along those lines, and that opening scene. And um, e- even with even despite all all of that just horrific activity, this is still a no no. This is still like a, a a line you don't cross. And um, I, I I just wonder what what you guys think that that's supposed to mean. Like, why is it such so horrific for someone else to touch someone else's uh, what what I guess I'm, I'm still assuming I'm not having gone so far enough into this. But what's not not being able to touch another person's uh, the personification of their soul. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. I feel like it's 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 like. A, it's, I, I don't know how to explain it, but maybe there's something about it that it's so raw and so, and so tender and personal, even more personal than your own body that you really can't, you you don't, you don't want anyone else touching it. You just don't. Um, it's your, your most personal, the most personal thing about you. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, think about the most personal thing on your own body and then amplify that and put it outside your body. 
Mm-hmm. And, and, and it, 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 there's emotion wrapped up into its physicality. There's touch. There, there's, uh, there's, you know, tactile feeling, all of it wrapped up in this little critter that's by your side. I think there's, there's just so much going on. Yeah, yeah I just psychologically, uh, too. Yeah. I just rewatched. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen it before, but I'm going to go 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 in deep on the nerd here. But I just rewatched uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion this week, and um, there's a concept in that series called the uh, the AT field, and AT stands for absolute terror. And we find out late in the series that uh, it's 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 like the field, the energy between our souls that makes us separate people. And, uh, I, you know, I, I just look at the, that and listen to that name, you know, absolute terror. And that's what, that's what, that's what separates us, you know? And then I think about this and how it's so ingrained in us that we can't touch another person's, you know, soul. And I, I go back to that concept, absolute terror. And I just wonder, you know, you know, maybe going too deep in, into this, but, uh, why is it so scary? Yeah, I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. I, I, I think that more, you know, we'll learn more about this, um, as we move forward, but this was, yeah, this was definitely a, a, a crack in the, in the door. And we're starting to be able to peek a little further into this, this relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and some further demon activity in this is the, you know, I've, I've been very fascinated by, demons talking and do all demons speak and do we hear them speak and do we do we sort of there hasn't been a lot of that in this we certainly hear pan talk um but uh as it turns out uh demons rarely talk to other humans besides their own uh but in necessary situations they do as with the dying egyptian man and he is too weak to speak but is his demon still is capable of speaking, even though he he's a little glazed over in the eyes. Mm-hmm. I found that to be pretty interesting. Um, I have a, the passage here. It says, Jacob nodded and cast his eyes at his demon. It was unusual for demons to speak to humans other than their own, but it happened sometimes, and she spoke now. So a little, a little, a little nugget there. Yeah, I don't know what it was about that scene, but that was just heartbreaking to me. Incredibly. You yeah. know? I just just the thought of of a person being so far gone that, you know, but he but this little part of him was still able to fight to, to pass on this message. And it's just, uh, you know, again, we you know, we, we've we've all talked about uh, the, uh, what demons we'd like to have and that kind of thing. And uh, a guinea pig for me, by the way. Lemur. And and um I would just like to. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little jealous, like I, uh, of the companionship. I just think it's really neat that they just always have somebody there who, you know, basically has their back. I just think that's the neatest thing. Yeah, is there loneliness in this world? I can't imagine it. You know, They've always got somebody right there to talk to. Do they get sick of each other? Right. That's a good question. That is a really good question. Right. Yeah. Like, do you ever want some time away from your demon? Can you want some time away from your demon? <laughs> put him in a little wooden box. Right. Put him to sleep. <laughs> That's right. Put him in a cedar box. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. what if you don't get along? What do you do? You, you know, if you were, yeah, I don't know, if you had, um, you know, in, in our society, there's people who have uh, uh split personalities and, and, um, you know, suffer from mental illness or depression, the, your demon would, I would assume would have some of those issues. Uh, and per- perhaps that could cause some friction between a demon and it's, and it's human. Oh gosh. How crazy would it be to have somebody with like four demons? Whoa. Right. Could you manifest more than one demon? Do we, are we going to find out? Oh, I hope so. Oh my gosh. That'd be amazing to know. That's really interesting. Okay. All right. And if that doesn't exist, we need to we need to head canon that into existence. Seriously, there are some. Uh, hopefully, there are some fan fiction writers who are listening to this who can get started on it right now. But you're absolutely right. That that sequence was was very stir- very uh, very unsettling, mm-hmm. and how um, 
and how they were able to, you know, same thing with Farter Quorum and, and being, you know, quite elderly and, and doesn't get around so well, but still sharp in the mind. But physically, his demon seems to be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, so this demon, even with a grave wound to its human, certainly in pain, but still capable and mobile, um, not damaged in any way, other than the fact that it's probably feeling pain. Just to correct myself here, uh, earlier I'd asked whether or not uh, Pan had existed when um, Mr. Coulter and uh, Lord Azrael had their fight, and apparently they did, because it says right here, uh, Ma, Coster, Ma Costa tells tells her about the, the scene, and she says that uh, Lord Azrael shot him right between the eyes and dashed his brains out. Then he says, cool as paint, which I really love. I love that, that line. Come out, Mrs. Costa, and bring the baby. Because you were setting up such a howl, you and that demon both. So whatever Pan looked like at that point was just wailing right along with, uh, with, with Lyra. You're absolutely right. I remember that now. However yeah, old yeah. she was at that time. Mm-hmm. Right. Good and point. I, I love, I love about this part too that not only was she in great pain, and and being able to speak for Jacob, but she also gives this little mew. Of like anxiety and love. Like she's not like she's upset, but she's also still comforting her human, even mm-hmm. while she's filling like all these other roles. Like it's just so dear. She mm-hmm. needs to go, she needs to go back to him. You know, she's she moves back and, and gets close to him again. Cause I think while they're talking to her, she's she's sort of not right next to him. And she knows she needs to go back and be with him, knowing that maybe it's the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sad. Very. Uh, so the um, the alethiometer comes into play here in a big way, in a big bad way. Yeah. We learn we learn a lot about how it's used, how it works. Uh, Lyra is instinctively learning how to use it with just the very little bit of information that she gets from Farter Quorum from the previous chapters. She's really starting to open herself up to it. She's starting to understand it more and uses interesting terms about um, how the layers of meaning for each each symbol. Um, I like the description about it being like descending a ladder in dark darkness. You put your foot down, not yeah. sure that there's a there's a rung there, but knowing it, pro- it's probably there. And when you step on it, you know it's there. So she's right. sort of aware of how the uh, the meanings can sort of she's starting to understand how that works a little bit more and under, and she's understanding how to um, allow herself to be calm and open and control the, the large hand a little bit more. It's not sort of spinning so much. She's able to slow it down and see where it stops and understand it's uh, what it's saying. Um, and she is, I think what is she what was what was from your recap Joanna about what she was um looking for for um uh she wanted to find out about what the spies were up to. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah, she wanted to find that and then yeah. She sees like a a, a hourglass with a skull I think and they're trying to decide on what that meant and whether it meant death. Uh Right. And then you know, when, when we find out there's been, you know, someone's Jacob's close to death, uh, you know, Farta Quorum's like, OK, hold on a second. Hold on a second here. <laughs> I think I think we might have something. Um, and of course, when Jacob, they leave Jacob, he's still alive. He says, if Jacob dies, we need to talk about this. Yeah, it really is an instinct. I mean, when I'm looking at the passage here while you were talking, I was looking it up. It says, um you know, I was just putting three pictures together because I was thinking about Mr. DeRuder. Um, I put together a, the serpent and the crucible and the beehive. And Farah Koram says, well, why these three symbols? And this is just her own, you know, like her own devising. She's like, well, you know, the serpent because they're cunning like a spy and the crucible because of knowledge and the beehive because of hard work. Like, I don't know that I would have thought of those three symbols 
Do you know what I mean? Like I, I, I would have no idea that I would have thought of those three symbols. I would have thought of maybe totally different symbols and not got, not have gotten an answer. But right. I think what I love about this is this idea that she, and let me find the page here because I had it. Um, I think it's on page 117 in my book, but it's talking about how she, um, when she would study the alethiometer and whenever she was alone, Lyra took out the alethiometer and poured over it like a lover with a picture of the beloved. Ah, uh, yes. I love that. Like she was just studying it in this way that was so intimate and so focused. And so, um, and then not only was she studying it like that, but she got this, she had this sort of entitlement that came with studying it. She's like, well, I'm, you know, why shouldn't I work out these meetings? They have several meetings. Well, why shouldn't I work it out? And I'm, I'm Lord Asriel's daughter, aren't I? Shouldn't I do this? Like there was this weird haughtiness that kind of came out, um, came out here that later on she does not feel so great that she can read the alethiometer. But right now she is just like, I deserve to read this. Well, she wants to, she wants to throw it away. She thinks, she thinks about throwing it into the fence. Right. And, uh, but then there's, you know, the other scene where she says, I need, you need to, you need to take me North with you. And they're, cause they're saying they're not going to. And she says, well, I, I can read this thing now. Like you're going to need me to do this. Right. You know, so she, you know, she's just a little ahead of the curve, but the ego is certainly present. I wonder, though, and I'm sure we'll learn more detail about this a little bit later. If since we know that there are an infinite number of meanings for each symbol, you know, if you you're not attributing your own meaning to the alethiometer, you know, she sees that bees are always working hard and, um, you know, the, 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 she thinks that the skull is death, all these types of things. And I just wonder if, uh, if it's not necessarily like that's what the alethiometer means. If that's not what, you know, the reader interprets from the reading. Oh yeah. It's just like an art, right? It's like an art. Um, you don't come to a canvas blank, like, you come and you bring your experience to the to the art and therefore you'll get from it. I can look at a piece and I'll get something from it that may be very different than what you would get from it, Travis, or what mm -hmm. or what Alaric would get from it because we bring our experience to it. I think that absolutely must be part of it because, again, I wouldn't have thought serpent and crucible and beehive. I, I would have probably thought of different things, but if I had, I'm going to call it the gift, I don't know, you know, maybe the Alethiambra still would have worked for me. Mm -hmm. So then it, it's what we were saying, like Alaric, it's more of a, something that's innately part of who you are versus something I can, I could never learn it unless I had it already. Right. See, I, what I was saying though is not so much that you couldn't learn it would be the, almost that you could, if you wanted to, or were told that you could, like, I almost see this as a metaphor for literature in and of itself that if you're told that you can read meaning into a book, you're going to, you can versus someone who, you know, just reads for words and doesn't get anything out of it beyond the text. You know, you're not going to get the true meaning of a, uh, of a work. But if you're told you, know, you can look at this and get all kinds of meaning, you know, you're going to do that too. It's exactly what I, I mean. I look at it in a, in a kind of a meta way. It's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> you know, I, I'm reading, reading this, looking for meaning in a text about looking for meaning. Right. You know, I, I, I work in dance and when you, when you watch people dancing a piece and you go in cold, it affects you in a certain way. But there's also times where you crack the program open and the choreographer has sort of written two paragraphs about what the piece is about. And if you read that before you watch the piece, you are informed by what the choreographer is sort of trying to say instead of letting it wash over you and you make your own decisions about this. And you're right, Travis, the way we're digging into this book, we're digging and mining and looking at little minute details. And it's sort of, you know, I, I've never really read a book like this where I read it in a tiny little chunk at a time. Like it's funny to sort of stop and you're like, okay, I'm not going to read any further, not just because I don't want to get confused. And, and, you know, if I read three chapters ahead, I wouldn't know where the, where to stop talking, you know? So I'm, I'm reading these tiny little minute 
bits and pieces and chunks, but as I'm reading it, I'm like drawing in the margins and circling things and making notes. And I don't read books like that. I normally sit down and just read it and let it wash over me. But on a second read, um, I find this to be really rewarding to, to really mine into this, really dig into this. And, and, you know, we could write a book about demons by the time we're done. We're so obsessed with demon life, right? We need to make a demon life website. We need to make a second website just about demon yes. life. That but demon it, life, y'all. Demon life. <laughs> L- <laughs> L-Y-F-E. I'm getting that tattooed on my uh, torso next week. <laughs> right, across, right across your belly. Demons L-Y-F. <laughs> oh my, can the demons have a Z? Can it be demons with a Z? How oh, could yeah. they not? Yeah, That's they right. Gotta. That's they right. Gotta. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the, so the alethiometer and, and what is really interesting in these chapters, trying to keep talking about how great these chapters are, Travis. Um, the, the alethiometer, we sort of, t- they talk about that perhaps there's a spirit inside of it, and that's what we're communicating with. Um, or there are spirits or multiple spirits inside of it. Um, what did you guys take, take in that? Did that guys hit you at all? Did it hit you at all? Yeah, I, I was... Um... When I was reading that little, there's a little um, kind of go between between Lyra and Pan, and and she's like, well, "What do you think's in here? Right. Is it, uh, you know, is it a spirit? Are there are there lots of spirits?" And then I love that Pan very tentatively is like, "Well, what if it's elementary particles? Mm-hmm. Like almost speaking out of his like expertise, but he's just kind of throwing it out there because he knows like those terms yeah. and." You know, and and so I don't know. I I don't know. She says it's like it's an intelligent being. Like she describes it um, as though it is this intelligent being that has knowledge of of things greater than like already has knowledge of things greater. It knows so, things. Yes, like it knows. Yeah. Things. It's not just like haphazardly or kind of putting things together. Like it is. It is an intelligent kind of being. And so, you know, it being a spirit then to me seems more fitting than like elementary particles which wouldn't necessarily have that same you know if it if it was like if it was like the internet right where she's using it to browse the internet and it is all of human knowledge in a little compass that doesn't account for what she's using it for which is what is mrs culture doing right now what is the where are the spies it's like it's able to see across space uh, and and see where things are and what is happening right now. Um, so it's not so much about what it knows uh, or what you know what it has known, but it is able to be current and be able to answer questions about what's happening in real time. Which that's the more magical element of it. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm totally with you on on the the fact that that's a more magical element, but uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, still the internet. I think the internet is is a great uh, illusion there because my my my. What I relate it to is you know something where you're looking at. Um, like security cameras and all kinds of things all across the all all across the entire world, and this thing's able to kind of like just give you boil down the the, the what's happening in the world. It's like you person know? of interest. I really was trying to avoid that. I, I, could, I could feel you going there. I, was, I, I, I hear what I, you're screaming. I appreciate you uh, going in there for me. <laughs> Thank you, because that's totally what I'm thinking. Well, has technology now caught up with the alethiometer at this right. point? Right. Right. You know, and, is this where we are now? And, um, you know, I, I, I kind of wonder, though, if there still is an element of interpretation to the, to that. I mean, we still, I, we can go to Google and, you know, Google up, you know, whatever we want. Um, but at the same time, we kind of have to have context and we have to kind of, we have to understand things and we interpret what we see. Right. And that's still what Liar is doing. So... You know, I, 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 I think that your um, your metaphor there for the Internet is, is pretty spot on. Hmm. Well, thank you. You're yeah, welcome. and way more way more sophisticated than mine. I was going to go to, like, Ralph Breaks the Internet. And when they have that little, <laughs> <laughs> when they have that little guy. And the they, like, no just more keep, or something? What is this? Yeah, name? it's like he just yeah. keeps throwing stuff out there till he hits what's right. 
Like, no, that's what I wanted. That, that's about where my mind it, was it's going. Like, so. It's like the predictive text of this. Of the, <laughs> it's like trying to figure out. She's like, no, 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 I didn't want to know that. Yes. Um, <laughs> now I'm, all, I'm always going to imagine a liar with Sarah Silverman's voice. Thanks, Joanna. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, you know, we were talking about the possible, you know, it could be elementary particles, could be a spirit or spirits inside of this device. Well, we do find out that there, this type of thing is done because the the spy fly, this thing that that attacks Pan, has it has a angry spirit wed to its mechanics, um, and that's interesting, right? That was my favorite part of these two chapters. I was so into that. I mean, a, a robot driven by a ghost is probably the most incredible thing I've ever thought I've ever heard of. How about the line where they said you could you could attach it to a rock or drop it into the ocean and it would eventually rust and once it rust and broke free, it would try it would go immediately to try to kill you again. Yep. Yep. Great stuff. Absolutely. Um, it made me think of the uh, the hunter seeker from Dune. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the Terminator. Or can't the be Terminator. Stopped, oh, I was can't be Terminator. With. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. But with a ghost inside. With a ghost inside. And then when it's smashed, the ghost uh, can lash out at the first thing it sees or the first person it sees, no mm-hmm. matter like what. Yeah, mm-hmm. like it's so full of rage and so full of like anger, like like that it that's what it wants to do. That's what it'll do. It remind me of and I'm I'm losing my train of thought here. Um what was it called in like Fantastic Beasts when they were the Obscurus? It it kind of reminded me of like an yeah. Obscurus. Do you know what I mean? Like this idea that it it can't even contain its own rage and will just, you know, it just needed to do its mission, which was to kill something. So if you took me out of my little wind up toy, now I'm just going to kill the thing that I see next. Mm -hmm. It's so angry. It's an angry little thing. It's like they're, you know, they're, they're putting it under things and sliding it into glasses. It's just like bouncing around and scratching and trying to get out. Um, Yeah. It's kind of scary. And 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 one of them got away. Yeah, one of them got away. Mm-hmm. And what spirit is it? Like, what, what is it a person spirit? Is it, I don't know, it's part of a demon? Like, what, what could be, what could be in Is it one of those scary things from the north and they put him in there? No, this was from the south. It was from uh, Morocco. Oh, that's right. Yes, yeah. yes. Af- Africa. They said it was in Africa. Africa, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Something yeah. I was really excited about, by the way, because it's very rare that you hear anything from, you know, south of the equator or especially Africa in um, modern fantasy when you're they, – they, they typically don't blend, you know? You don't have um, – uh, both, uh, you know, the North and the South, uh, hem- Northern and Southern hemispheres kind of, uh, interacting in uh, a lot of fantasy. And I thought this was super neat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Agreed. that's true. Gave it a, yeah. gave, gave us a much larger tapestry. Yeah. And I hope that they would, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't remember, but I would hope that they would go into that a little more. Like I would love some more detail of that, mm-hmm. of that other part of the world. Mm-hmm. So fa- yeah, I mean, so we're giving a whole bunch of people fanfic, like we're fodder. <laughs> like they, they need to be like writing all of this stuff down. Seriously, we have great I- yeah, we have great ideas. So flush it out for us, please. We should add a section to our site for fanfic. Yes. Ooh, Joanna. Yes, <laughs> I'm on it. Yep, I will make that happen. Yeah, you know, this this spe- it's interesting about the spirits because you know I was thinking about okay, so if if a human dies, then we think that maybe there's a spirit that continues in in, the, in this world. Um, but the night gassed is not necessarily the same thing. And Pan and, and Lyra talk a little bit about that and that, oh, it's a different kind of spirit. So maybe it could be a spirit that's not attached to or was never attached to a, a, a person or, or, or a living thing. It's mm-hmm. just a piece of the universe that has a personality, I guess. I don't know. I don't know that we'll find out, but yeah, I don't know. Yes, yeah, so there seems to be a lot of different spiritual elements here that maybe aren't completely tied to humans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she and Lyra says, um, she says very, she's like, look, there are more than one kind of spirit. Right. You can't see them all, so you know who knows what it could be. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, all this discussion um, makes me think about um, the the term theology in these books because theology doesn't mean what we what it means to us. Like it's really not about uh, metaphysics so much as actual physics. 
Right. And um, I'm 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 really interested in how that happened in this world, you know, because uh, she talks about that photo mill in the in the in the, in the mass when um, they they revealed like that technology that um, made like the weather weather vane type thing spin around when light touched it. Yes. And, uh, yes first of all, that. is that a thing? Because I, I I tried to Google it um, hard looking for for it and I I could not find anything along those lines so I'm not sure if that's something that exists that uh, you know I I'm just not aware of but um, yeah it was, it was just really neat that that existed and it existed in the context of a religious. Um, service like a relic would be in art, like the right, like you, yeah. There, yes, it's almost like right. a relic, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, uh, it, it also made me made me wonder: is it a relic of a past civilization on this world that used to have this type of technology, or you know, it, just did? The things that we see as religious and you know supernatural in our world manifest themselves as some kind of technology in their world. I it's just it, Pullman just made such has just created such a rich world, mm-hmm. and you know every few pages, despite my my uh, my complaints about the exposition bomb earlier, every few pages there's still just like a little piece of it that's tossed in, and you're just like, oh my god. And I, I love how different they are. Like the alethiometer, it just, you know, it speaks truth. Cap, I guess capital T truth. Mm-hmm. Um, but this this photo mill illustrated moral lessons. And, and, and you know, and, and there had to be an intercessor, um, that I, I guess an intercessor that was able to read it and then explain what it was. And, of course, I love that Lyra, she couldn't remember what the lesson was. But she just remembered all the little whirly gigs and was like kind of she fascinated by those. Just just like a child would, right? Like the yeah. moment that, that's how they draw you in. You know, mm-hmm. that's right. like the kids are like, ooh, you know, kind of wowed by this. Um, but but she does remember that the librarian said that whatever it meant, because he wasn't even exactly sure. He said that they were delightful, that whatever they meant, it was all done by the power of photons, which is why I think Pan thinks it, you know, it's elementary particles that are sort of running these these machines. And then how many, what other kinds of machines are there? There's alethiometers, there's photo mills, what other kind of moral lessons or truths, like what other kind of technologies are, exist to mm-hmm. round out this, you know, sort of our own, our, our worldviews and our understandings. Yeah. I wonder if we'll, uh, we'll see some, some interesting things in the books to come. Maybe we- two specific ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, Didn't we yeah. hear earlier that uh, weren't philosophers, um, uh, uh, weren't sci- scientists to us, uh, referred to as philosophers in this world? It seems to be, yeah. I, I, I think we may have heard that at some point, and that to me really would uh, would, would make make a make a real connection here. If um, we were seeing science as uh, more of a philosophy-based thing rather than a fact-based thing. Because if she's finding truth in this machine, then uh, it stands to reason that, um, you know, you the person who would study things like that would be a philosopher, not necessarily a scientist. Well, an alethiometer, if it is indeed controlled by some otherworldly force, um, that's not so much science. Uh, and rather something else entirely, something mm-hmm. that we don't have in our world. You know, once we finished uh, this book, uh, we really need to get a philosopher on the show and talk to them a little bit, I think. I think there's a couple that we know on uh, on one of our, our groups that uh, would be excited about participating. That would be fun. Yes. Uh, so the... Uh, she uses the lithiometer again, but doesn't really doesn't really trust the outcome enough to understand what it means as far as what um, what Mrs. Coulter's up to. Um, it's the final symbol, right? The final symbol is the one she doesn't quite figure out. Mm-hmm. Right, like it's the um, it's the, um, a lizard with the tail. 
Twirl. That's a chame- she didn't know what a chameleon was. She didn't right. She didn't know it was a chameleon. Which apparently don't need to eat. They can live on air. Which I'd never heard that before. Yeah, what was that? <laughs> I, that was so weird to like, me. Like okay, all right. I'm not sure I'm with you there. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. Uh, so and then because she couldn't really figure it out quickly enough or understand it well enough, it sort of leads to this spy fly attack. Mm-hmm. Well, and far decorum. I, I kind of love it. It's like this, his, like his little old curiosity got the best of him. Like he oh, was totally. sitting there patiently waiting and he kind of interrupted her. Like he, she probably would have gotten it. Yes. I think at some point, but he was she like, calls him out. Hey, she calls him yeah, out. I know. She's like, dude, if you had interrupted there. me, yeah, I was <laughs> I right there. It was just like, what's going on? He's, uh, you know, he's his fascinated credit. by the process. Sorry. I was just going to say that Farter Quorum is very fascinated by the process and how she does it and, and you know, the, the her mind and how she's figuring all these things out. So, you know, he, he couldn't help but jump in. You know, he's, he's excited by it. Mm-hmm. To his credit, he also apologized to her he when, when uh, he realized that it was his fault. He's like, I'm sorry. My bad. Oh, can I tell you how much I love their relationship right now? I love I love that the way that they interact with each other. I love the way that Lyra um, sees him. And I'm jumping the gun, but it is really it's probably my favorite. Um, I will quote it as my favorite uh, part and my other favorite part. But when she's talking about how she loved him, um, even for the way he directly reprimanded her, like as a grandfather figure, like she has this mother figure that she kind of does not really want. She has this father figure that she sort of respects, but still has, you know, questions about, but then here's Farter Coram. And I feel like it's just like a grandfatherly kind of relationship for her. And it's just, so, it's very sweet. And he gets as much out of it as she does, which is what I, I love that. It's not like, it's like, he's just being this benevolent, like kind of just, you know, what's, I'm trying to think of the word, like just, just humoring her. Right. Like he takes he's genuinely interested in her and he really enjoys being around her. And he, you know, she gives him as much as he gives her. It's just I love it. He knows he can't do it. Like whatever it is that she's doing, he can't do it. And he's he's fascinated by it. He's excited by it. He's thrilled by it. And and he's he thinks she's just the bee's knees in some ways. Mm -hmm. Um but he knows she she has something that he doesn't have. She has she has a gift. I mean, it's one of these things we hate to say she's some, you know, she's a, a savant or something. But she's she has a gift. There's something that she can do with this thing that people knew she could. Right. Uh, the the line here, at the end of this uh, uh, this another more Lyra and Farta Corum sort of being together, uh, and talk about how he's a chess player and he knows how to play chess. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Uh, Lyra's eyes moved the same way according to some similar magnetic field that she could see and he couldn't. So he knows he can't do it, whatever it is. Another bit that I, uh, I really appreciated that you mentioned in the uh, open was John Fah's dressing down of naysayers and how easily he does it. Um, he's, a, he's, he's a pretty powerful dude. Uh, he says what he says and people pretty much sit down and shut up. Uh, I didn't really love how he treated the women, and I didn't really like how the women felt like their place would be to take care of kids, and that was it, um, and maybe prepare food. Even Lyra steps into that a little bit. Uh, where, well, who's going to take care of the kids? I'm a kid. I could help with the kids. Um, they're just going to take 170 men, and he sticks He sticks by that. He says he's going to think about it, and apparently he does, um, but they just take 170 dudes and Lyra. She said, although she does get a private bunk, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, she gets like her own little cupboard. Yeah. Under the stairs. Right, her own little cupboard. <laughs> yeah. You know, a uh, quick thought about um, Lyra. I-, I was just thinking about her in the alethiometer, and I wondered if her ability to lie is part of the reason that she's able to use that alethiometer. You know that because that ability to lie means that she's she's thinking on the fly. She's making she's making things up. She's creating a world. She's finding um, meaning in all kinds of uh, where she's creating meaning for all kinds of uh, run of the mill activities. And I just wonder if if that whole deceiver thing, as as uh, Ma Costa called her, is part of the reason that she's uh, she's so good with that alethiometer. 
Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point. Yeah, that's a great. Gosh, drop the mic. Good point, though. Yeah. Yeah, how do you follow that? I can't follow that. Yeah, I don't have much. To, I, I don't have much to add to that. Do you guys have any other notes that you want to talk about these chapters? Anything that popped out at you? Um, not so much. No, I mean my my uh, stuff was going a little wonky there, so I, you cut out on me for a second. Um, but I I appreciate that you touched a bit on the way that women were treated here because I feel like it it goes back to the point we made in the very like first um, full. Uh, episode that we did where I don't think women have the power in, in, in this world, like we want them to, or hope they do. Um, and so, you know, the two, two parts that stuck out to me, one was when the woman, women were like, well, are you taking women along because they are going to be children and yeah, there's, you know, caregivers and they're going to be scared and they're going to want some comfort, et cetera, et cetera. You might be fighting, but the women were also the ones that stood up and said, what are you going to do when you find them? What are, are you like John Farr? Are you, are you, you know, calling them out? Like, are you going to take them out? Like, are, what, are you going to revenge, avenge and take revenge on these people for doing what they did? Like they were the ones that were like, what you going to do? And, and he had to sort of, you know, he was like, look, I will do it, but I can't do it um, too soon. Because I, you know, he's like, I, to win this, like this little battle means we would lose this war. Um, but it was the women who were also calling for, kind of calling for like the blood. So not yeah, that it has, you know, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, you're absolutely right. He, 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 the way that she's talking about um, revenge and how he's trying to be as measured as he can in his response he also seems to maybe know that this is a many-headed beast. It's maybe not just in one place. And I, I'm not sure how he would know that yet, um, considering they seem to be heading in one direction to one place where they believe the children are. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure why he feels confident that just taking out this one place where the kids are is going to solve the problem. He already seems to know that it's bigger than this. Right. Probably well, we because know. of the way they're hunting down Lyra. So many, there's so many resources trying to find her. Yeah, we know the General Oblation Board is extremely powerful, and we know that they're directly connected to the Magisterium. So it stands to reason that uh, you know just stopping the this one facet of the General Oblation Board is still going to bring the the Magisterium on you. It's like uh, you know if the, you've got an IRS field office that that uh, you, you've you managed to pull the plug on, you're, you've still got a lot more of the IRS coming after your taxes. <laughs> but I did my turbo taxes, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> I chose the do not review. Is that okay? <laughs> uh so beyond these chapters, there was some additional His Dark Materials news this week. Um, of course, we all know that San Diego Comic-Con was taking place, and we got to see a little bit of extra footage uh, from extended trailer for the series. Did you guys get a chance? I know you guys got to watch it, but did you guys watch it, and what did you think? Oh, I, I watched it, and I got just chills. Like, I actually got goosebumps, particularly when... Um, when Yorick comes out and they just have this beautiful shot, this beautiful composed shot of just his face, his, his gnarled, like war, you know, weathered kind of tired looking for a bear, mm -hmm. I guess. Can a bear look tired? <laughs> and he just, you know, this beautiful shot. Um, and I just got chills because I feel like looking at the casting and looking at the way that they've stylized it, it just looks like such a beautiful, um, rendering of his work, which I know is part of what made people upset in other representations. Sure. Yeah. You know, we might want to slap a spoiler warning on this part of the conversation. Um, just because, you know, we're, we're talking about the trailer is going to go deeper than we are in the book. It's true. It's a good point. Spoilers. Don't spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> For instance, we don't know what a Yorick is yet. <laughs> no, we do not. <laughs> Uh, it's so a symbol on the lithiometer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say that for now. Uh, yeah, I, my take was was uh, it was it was a, it was a sizzle reel, and it looked pretty awesome. 
Uh, it's very exciting. Um, the cast looks terrific. Although, you know, I think we already talked about McAvoy maybe seems a little slight. Um, I thought Ms. Coulter looks pretty solid. Um, it's, is it Ruth Wilson is playing her? Is that who it is? She is. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes, She's she, terrific. She, yeah. She was on Luther, uh, you know, and had played a pretty terrible person on that show. So I'm trying She's now not cast. to do spoilers. <laughs> yes, Absolutely yeah, incredible she, but, on Luther. Yeah, but but what a what a great pick, and and I cannot get over Daphne Keene. I am just over the stars, head over. I know Liar is supposed to be blonde, but Daphne Keene. When I heard that they cast her, I was just over the moon. Like she is such an amazing little actress, and she can bring, I think, the depth and the complexity and all of these those the wonder to Lyra that we want to see. What else do I know her from? Hmm. Logan Wolverine. Oh, yeah, well, Logan. <laughs> Oh, that's her? That's her. Yeah, that's Whoa. her. That's yeah. crazy. I yeah. know, but she's amazing. Yeah, apparently that was, they when they were casting for that part in Logan, um, she like literally blew everybody away. People were stunned by how good she was. And she doesn't even talk in that movie. Right? No. She's just a like, physical not, presence. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think she's going to just slam dunk Lyra. That means that she'll have been in scenes with both Professor X's, by the way. Oh, boy. <laughs> I told you I'm going deep in the nerd today. <laughs> uh, but yet there you see the airships in the in the trailer. Yes. They, they, they definitely kept with that, you know, steampunk element, mm-hmm. uh, which is, is pretty cool. Uh, you know, Lin-Manuel, I'm not there yet with him. Um he, I don't know, maybe he's too young or I, I'm not sure how I'm feeling. I, I like him quite a bit. Um, so I, I need a little bit of time um, with that. I need to process that a little bit. And we're not talking about his character yet. So uh, um, that's interesting. But, you know, another thing, they really were smart and hid a lot of demons. They didn't yeah. really like you see Pan and he's so cute. Um mm-hmm. But you don't see a lot of other demons running around, so that'll be nice. They're they're kind of it seems to be holding that back a little bit, which is nice. Uh, have we heard anything about voice actors yet for I, any? any I of the think characters? we might only have one or two of the voice actors. I went on IMDb to sort of hunt that down. Pan is listed, okay. and maybe uh, is it Stel Stelmaria? Is that the one? I think that one might be listed. I think so. Um, but nobody else. That I think that's quiet. That's it's being kept quiet. Because okay. who was I looking for? I was looking for one in particular, and I couldn't find it. Um, but the, again, the casting looks pretty solid, and um, uh, we, we've even seen casting for further into the series than this book, um, which is interesting because they already greenlit uh, season two. That's so exciting! It's I incredibly know. exciting. And of course, we'll talk about all the episodes right here on uh, the Amber Spycast, of course. Of course. Of course. Uh, so, uh, I also wanted to, as we're closing out this episode, wanted to mention that our website is live, uh, big shout out to, uh, everyone here, but, uh, Joanna in particular really mm-hmm. uh, spearheading that and shepherding that into, uh, our, I guess we launched it uh, late, late this week and we're, looks, looks awesome. Great job, Joanna. Yeah. This really does oh. look awesome. Thank you. It was really fun, and I'm super excited for you guys to um, to click and visit. It's the amberspycast.com. We have gallery picks, and we have um, lots of links you can click to see trailers, and we'd love your feedback. So if you visit, please visit the contact page, contact us page, and give us some feedback at feedback at the amberspycast.com. We know you're listening. I get to I get to look at where every you know all the people who are downloading. So I know there's a few of you out there. So other than Travis, the other Travis, <laughs> the other Travis. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and and we're on Facebook as well. So uh, check us out there. Uh, and if you're listening to the podcast on a specific um, platform, uh, throw a review on there and a, and a star rating. Uh, we'd love to see those, but also boosts our presence a little bit. Uh, so I guess that's it. You want to wrap up, guys? Yeah, and thanks everybody for listening. I look f- looking forward to next week. Next week oh, is at, pa- yeah, it's particularly exciting because we're heading into part two of the book, official part that's two r- of the book. Yes. That's right, official part two. So it'll be chapters nine and ten, um, and we will start as they head up through um, through the north. So super cool. Uh, ten awesome. and eleven. Ten and eleven. <laughs>
what did I say? Nine and 10. Yeah. 10 and 11. My bad. I'm so sorry. 10 and 11. Uh, can we fix that in post? <laughs> <laughs>